do a meeting on the first Monday of every month. So uh, again, we're going to try and keep them really regular. Um, the so I need to make a quick mention for our sponsors for the user group. So thanks to Saravana and the BizTalk 360 team, who um, you know they're going to sort out the go to meeting stuff for us for these uh, webcasts, and also they're a great sponsor. Full stop. Um, other sponsors, we've got a plural site who are a training company, a bit like Quick Learn as well, and also Hancock and Parsons are our recruitment sponsor. And the, yeah, the last thing's really just to introduce Josh, who, who will tell you a bit about himself. And Josh is going to be talking about API management in Azure. I think if I, uh, if I just hand over to you now, Josh. Thanks, Michael. How do I share my screen? Do you need to make me a presenter or something? Oh, I've okay, just, just, just done yeah. that, mate. Okay, when ready, uh, show my screen. Can you guys see? Yes, yeah. The slide, yeah, you can see the slide with the plugs. Yeah. Actually, Josh, uh, what, what we'll do as well during the meeting, if anybody has any questions, if they, if they want to pop them up in the, um, in the window, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on them for you, Josh, and we'll, we'll go through them later on. Okay, and, yeah, um, that's what works best. We'll, yeah, and if, if any, any really poignant ones come up, I'll, I'll just give you a shout halfway through, and then I guess at the end, if we've got a few minutes left, we'll, we'll maybe put everyone back on voice, and people can just ask any questions they want to. I'll try to rush through then, actually, to try and give us a few minutes. I do have a, another meeting um, at 12, uh, 12 noon PST, so I'll have to dash off uh, pretty promptly, but we can try and finish a little bit early, so there's definitely time for questions. Uh, let's get started then. So, so my name is Josh. I am a PM in the Azure team, as Michael mentioned. Notice it's Microsoft Azure, not Windows Azure now. Um, and I work on two products, both of which will probably be familiar to this audience. So I work on the API management solution that we just introduced to market, and I also work on part of BizTalk Services, which is hybrid connections, which was a, also a feature we launched at TechEd. Um, today's talk will be about um, API management. Um, and uh, this is a, an integration or a connected systems audience, so you guys probably get this. But one thing I do find is uh, talking about API management, it takes people a while to grok it. I know from my own experience, it took me some time when I, when I took this product on to really internalize what API management was about. And it is not something that is easy to give um, an elevator pitch. Um, it, we find it very difficult to do a sort of a sort of one or two sentences job on explaining API management. So, with that knowledge in mind, what I always do when I present on this stuff is do spend a few slides or a few minutes trying to make sure everybody's uh, the field is leveled. And even if you guys already know about it, let's make sure that we're using the same terminology so that you know as we engage and as we ask questions or talk about the product, we're talking about the same stuff. Um, and so, I want to talk um, a little bit about API management um, at a high level. When I'm, when I'm presenting on this, I usually like to show this quote. Um, and this quote uh, is from a guy called Byron Dieter. He's a partner at Bessemer Ventures, so you know uh, they invest in a lot of these very forward progressive businesses like Twilio and DocuSign and Box and SendGrid, etc. Um, and they're all good examples, actually, of businesses that are uh, front and foremost in the API economy. Let me read the quote quickly. So in little more than a decade, APIs have transitioned from relative obscurity. I, I like that quote because it resonates with me entirely. Uh, my wife is not technical. She's not really into computers other than, you know, she uses them, but she's not. She's not a geek like me. Um, but she now knows what an API is, which is which I think is amazing because APIs have always meant something to me as a developer or someone who who is a geek. And um, you know, I've dealt with APIs I, from the point it meant something in COM or it meant something in the .NET base class libraries to understanding what it meant in terms of a SOAP API or a web service API and a HTTP API. But it was always an extremely um, nerdy venture. It was always uh, something developers cared about or architects cared about. Now it's something that the general public and business people for sure are aware of. They can discuss APIs. They know that business models can be built about APIs. My wife knows that an API is how the Fitbit she wears on her wrist communicates with her phone. It's how, albeit indirectly, how the smart 
scale at home talks over Wi-Fi to the cloud. She knows that that's through an API. She even says things like, I, I have an electric car, I have a Nissan Leaf. Um, and she says things, does it have an API? Could you automate that thing by the API? She gets it. APIs have genuinely transitioned out of obscurity. Um, let me continue the, the quote. To become the digital glue that empowers developers to create new software, apps, partnerships, and even new businesses. The business to develop a market. Again, this business to develop a market was a, another notion that, that was part of the journey of really grokking what API management was all about. It's quickly becoming one of the fastest growing opportunities within cloud computing, so a hint there as to why Azure is interested in this. And we'll talk a little bit more about the business to develop a market as we look at some examples of, of, of that business model in action. Um, as we're talking about business models then, let's look at some different ways that people are leveraging um, APIs to make money at the moment. So I think of um, one axis upon which we may think of an API as being either public or being private. And as with all axes, there's something of a spectrum there. Sometimes we have completely public APIs that anyone can come and use, literally go and find the weather API on Yahoo and just call it, um, to a private API that might be private and internal to a business, or a private API that might be shared with select partners only. Um, Another access is, why does this API exist? Am I directly monetizing it? Am I actually going to charge for use of this API, which is a, a common business model, you know, Twilio, et cetera. We'll talk about those in, 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 uh, in more detail. Or am I indirectly monetizing it? Am I using this for some other reason? Maybe I'm indirectly monetizing it by um, uh, using it as a marketing tool, and we'll talk about some examples of that. Or maybe it's just a cost of doing business. You know, maybe maybe having an API is a, a is is critical to my existence. What I'm going to do now is skip through those slides and move to some examples that fall on those axes. So if we think about public APIs, we see public APIs as kind of the tip of the iceberg. The, this is the um, there's a lot of public APIs, but there's many many more private or internal APIs that sit underneath that tip of the iceberg. And when we think about those two monetization models we just described, there's a couple of examples that come to mind. So one of my favorites is Twilio. Uh, by the way, none of these guys are running on Azure API management. I just think they're great examples of of APIs that are. Um, that help describe the API economy as we think of it. So directly monetizing an API, Twilio, if you're unfamiliar, with, I, I guess everyone in this audience knows about Twilio, but I'll, I'll just explain something about them anyway, is a telecoms company that kind of turned the idea of telecommunication integration on its head. Traditionally, if you'd have wanted to build a service that could call patients the day before their appointment and remind them that they have an appointment at 2 p.m. the next day or send them an SMS, this was a really uh, a non-trivial endeavor. You know, you had to have a conversation with a telecommunications provider. You probably had to go and install some PBX switches, multi-million dollar mess on your hands. Twilio really turned that on its head. Now, within 20 minutes, you can sign up for Twilio's service and invoke their API and be sending SMSs and making and receiving phone calls from a backend within 20 minutes. It really is that easy. So a very, very disruptive move, uh, fantastic business. And of course, for them, APIs are how they do business. An API is to Twilio as a retail store is to Gap, or as a retail store, or as an e-commerce presence is to um, uh, Amazon. You know, this is how they do business. Um, another example. Now, I like Walgreens because often when we talk about API economy, we talk about the new businesses like Twilio and Box and SendGrid that are relatively uh, uh, in their infancy, really, they're quite new businesses. Walgreens, um, since this is, I think, a mostly UK audience, is one of the largest pharmacies over here in the, in the US, similar to Boots in the UK. Um, and they, uh, they're, they're a poster child of the uh, API economy with something they did that was pretty interesting. So they were going to build a, a phone application that allowed you to upload pictures from your phone to their servers and then they'd be printed out at your local Walgreens store and you can drive by and pick up your pictures. So, you know, Boots have the same thing, if I recall, when I lived in the UK a few years ago. You know, you could get pictures printed out there. Now, wouldn't it be cool if you could directly upload them from your phone and just go and collect them at your local Boots? Now, they were going to build a phone app to do this. However, they realized that building a, a, an iOS or an Android or Windows phone application 
that's a thing, but actually getting any visibility, having any success with an app in the marketplace is notoriously difficult. You could sink money after money after money into this thing and still not get any visibility in the app store. So they decided to take a different track. They decided a different business model that hinged upon APIs. What they did was they created a public API, anybody can come and use it, that allowed app developers to integrate with that API and oh, let me just ignore these messages. Um, that integrated with that API and um, um, allowed uh, developers to upload pictures from their own applications and have them printed at Walgreens. And Walgreens would do a revenue share model with those developers, so they'll get 10 cents for every picture that's printed. So fabulous idea, because app developers are already starved of income and looking for additional revenue sources. Walgreens would get a much better presence in the application marketplace, and all they have to do is ship an API. Now, a pretty compelling case, and seen as a poster child of the API economy, because it's been very successful. Um, another good example, of course, is, uh, sorry, let's talk about indirect monetization now. Now, when we think about indirect monetization, this is not people making money out of APIs directly. They're not, they're not uh, monetizing in any way the API initially. And a common one that comes up here is any of the SaaS vendors, so anyone who's in that SaaS ecosystem um, in terms of software as a service. So Box is a, a good example of this. And it is simply a cost of business, a cost of, it's a utility piece of computing for them. That if you're in this SaaS ecosystem now, you have to have an awesome to use easy to understand, easy to learn API, otherwise you can't enter this space. And that's because all of these best of breed vendors have to be extremely easy to integrate. It has to be easy for me to glue my box to my Salesforce, to my DocuSign, otherwise it's too hard for customers that are choosing these best of breed solutions to glue them together and you can't thrive as part of that ecosystem. So a great API program for these guys is simply um, important for their existence. If they don't do it, they won't make any money, and therefore it's indirect monetization of our API. Now, again, Box is a new business. What about some of the older guys? So a more traditional business we might think of is good old British Airways. Um, and British Airways recently launched their open API program where they provide access to a lot of their data and services uh, via a public API that anyone can come and use. And um, uh, uh, this allows you to, I don't know, you can look up flight times, you can look up availability of parking spaces at airports that British Airways um, has flights going to and from. You can look up flight arrivals. And it's something of a more speculative bet on the value of an API in terms of British Airways believe, and, and it's not just British Airways, many, many businesses um, are getting in on this now, um, believe that if app developers or website developers or service developers integrate British Airways data and services into their own capabilities, then that provides a better experience for British Airways customers when they're using these, um, these services and therefore makes it more likely for British Airways to get return visits, return customers. So it's basically marketing and it's becoming so predominant now that it's actually uh, the, the, the business of selling or a business of an API program for these guys is becoming the, the odd one out. And so the, the, the panics and rushing towards having an API program now because everybody else has one. And they don't want to be the only business that doesn't have this. So it's interesting how that, that whole paradigm has turned from being leadership, showing leadership, to becoming a requirement um, to have such API programs. To the point where I regularly have calls with financial institutions that are looking to have an API program, which is amazing really because these guys are typically more conservative. You know, they're, they're, they're not, always showing leadership in terms of public and um, sharing data in this way, but they're realizing that it's critically important for them to be competitive and to keep up with these emerging new businesses like Stripe and Square, et cetera, that are you know, moving, making moves into the financial space. Now, I'll quickly talk about a couple of private and internal APIs as well. Um, when I think about direct monetization and private APIs, I think about partner to partner. So this will be very, very familiar to this audience, business to business integration. Um, and I, I recall a story actually, um, so I say top secret here because I'm not going to name any names if it's a private API, um, where I used to work at the UK's largest travel consolidator and one of my jobs was to build a, you know, this was 12 years ago I think now, build a SOAP API that allowed one of our partners to do a reselling um, business model. They could resell our flights through their own website. 
and we spent some time building a web service that made it easy for those guys to call us and um, sure enough they were up and running in no time it proved a very good additional source of revenue for our business and for those um, so it was a great partnership but then one day a bug triggered a bug uh, you know a bug was uh, found in the code that made uh, that that showed a uh, for loop, a nasty for loop in their logic that basically meant their service dosed our service. So their service dosed our internal systems, it actually brought down the Amadeus system in, in Belgium, which is the core flight booking system for all, uh, for most of Europe's um, uh, flight traffic or flight ticketing, and um, obviously brought down our own website. And the next day I was called into work, you know, got slapped around a little bit, and our first call of action was to go and put some rate limiting, because whilst we care about our partners, we care about ourselves much more. And so we decided that we would rate limit partners to ensure that they could never bring down our core mis mission business critical systems um, uh, internally. And so this is very common, you know, this idea of business to business and private APIs, which is different to public APIs because it's not an anybody can come and sign up for this. There is usually boardroom level negotiation going on to decide on an agreement before people get access to the API. Now, when I think about internal APIs and API programs. I think about um, one business in particular actually that's done very well with respect to this and is famous for its agility. And that's our good old friends, our neighbors here in the Seattle area, Amazon. So Amazon have been seen by industry as being uh, tr uh, transforming their business, following an edict Jeff Bezos had to his um, to his employees and technical staff about eight years ago, I think it was. And you may have read about this on a blog post about four years ago by a guy called Stephen Yeg, who wrote about um, uh, a commandment that was passed down from Bezos that said, from now on, all services, all interaction across teams in Amazon will be done via services and via APIs. And he also placed another instruction in there that said, what's more, not only will you do all of your internal transactions using services, you will make sure that those services are externalizable. And that was an, a clever trick, because what it did was it really raised the bar that said, if you want to um, build a service inside Amazon that other teams can use, you have to provide awesome documentation. You have to really think about the quality of that service, because we need to be able to turn around and externalize it at a moment's notice, which really changes the the paradigm. And I think may have been something so, speaks somewhat to some of the SOA programs that failed. You know, these services were just too hard to use, too hard to learn. There wasn't the right focus on developer usability when people were building these internal service um, service oriented architectures. Now, of course, this m meant that not only was Amazon a super agile business and has been very successful in terms of its internal agility, but it also led to the birth of AWS, of course, because they turn around and put their data centers on online, or at least the, that's so the story goes. And um, uh, that, of course, is the big rival to, to Azure. So what we're seeing is huge interest in API programs in terms of um, providing APIs that are easy to use, that developers can be very successful when they're trying to use internally inside organizations. In fact, our own MSIT is very, very interested in doing this. Um, so those are some examples of API business models. And the minute you decide, hopefully you're all excited about um, having an API program, but the minute you decide that you want an API program, you basically uh, walk into, uh, you know, you open a can of worms. There are a lot of challenges that you need to solve. How are you going to engage with developers? How are you going to provide great documentation for, for those developers? If you think about a public API program, having um, documentation that's of an adequate standard is critical. We, we're all, uh, I guess we're all developers on this call, and we know how fussy we are about good documentation. How are you going to reduce the time to first successful call? So from the moment that a developer decides to try your API, how long does it take for them to be successful? That is a critical metric if you're going to have a successful API program. Um, how, how do you enforce business policies? So if you decide to bundle and sell your APIs in terms of, you know, maybe you have a free trial that lasts 30 days and you want to expire access to that API after that time period, or if you have a, um, a uh, uh, an API that includes a quota. So, you know, maybe I have an enterprise edition that includes um, uh, 10,000 API calls per month, or I have um, uh, 
an, AP, uh, an addition that only includes 1,000 API calls per month. How do I count those and count them across a distributed system? These are all non-trivial problems that aren't really your core business priority. You want to be delivering value, uh, for example, if you're Twilio that is uh, oriented around um, telecommunications. Um, how do you make a, a, an API that is a legacy data or service modern? You may already have a bunch of data and services that you could just expose to the internet, but you can't call that an API program. You can't take a SOAP API, throw it on the internet, and then expect iOS developers to, to use it. You know, calling SOAP from iOS is extremely difficult. You need a modern API. You need HTTP, you need JSON, etc. So how are you going to convert that um, from uh, your legacy API? And how are you going to understand the behavior of your API program? So you may um, have already have, uh, let's imagine you're about to do a marketing campaign. You know, you're about to launch a website that's promoting your new product. It would be unthinkable that you would do that without plugging in web analytics. So you can understand how your website's performing, where the traffic's coming from, are you converting people to their goals, um, uh, is your site performing? Is it having errors? Are the issues? And the same goes for your API. Your API is your digital website. It is your uh, digital marketing campaign. And you need to have insights into calls, which pro products are successful. Uh, are you having any issues? Are there errors on the API? Is it performing? What is the response time? You need exactly those for your API program as well. And how are you going to protect your mission, your mission critical business systems? I gave an example of how this actually happened to me in real life 12 years ago. Now, do you really want to go and build a rate limiting capability? Wouldn't it be much better if you could just buy or reuse something as a service though? And all of these problems we think of as being API management. These are the problems API management helps people solve in the same way that a point of sale system helps Gap have a retail store or a point of sale system or you know, an e-commerce platform helps um, uh, people doing e-commerce sell online. You don't want to go and build all of these mundane capabilities yourself. It's much more cost effective for businesses to leverage um, an existing capability that's already been built to solve these problems. Now, we realized that. We wanted to get a, boot, a, boot, um, a bootstrap into the market. And so in October last year, the joke goes we had an epiphany and we purchased a company um, uh, that was a, a, a small startup in Washington DC that was an API management company and um, we launched this as an Azure product, Azure API management into market in May, on May 12th um, this year, so just, uh, just over a just over two months ago at TechEd. Um, it's going great actually so far. We have a ton of customers interested in this. Uh, we have customers that need features as, as you would expect and so we're very interested to hear your feedback on the service. I'd love to, um, uh, if we have time at the end of the call, I'd love to hear if you guys have tried it out yet and whether you have any gaps or thoughts on the service. Um, but so far, we're really impressed with the uptake of this, cost uh, of this service. We have over, well over a thousand customers um, using the, um, the service since launch. So, let me give you a bit of an explanation as to um, what Azure API management is in terms of its logical setup. So, let's imagine that you guys have an existing API that you want to enable an API program. That might be an old API that you've decided you can add more, you can, you know, you can gain some additional value by exposing it through an API program. Or maybe it's a new API that you've created. You've decided you have a cool new business that's going to sell some data, you know, or sell some services via an API. Then you can go and build your um, uh, mission critical, sorry, you can go build your uh, business functionality and then rather than have to build all of the good stuff that Azure API management brings to the table, you can just plug us in. So API management has three components, a developer portal, a proxy, and a publisher portal. So you are, in this case, as the owner of the API, you are the publisher. You are the person that is publishing the API out there either publicly or privately um, to developers. Um, developers use your developer portal to learn how to make it, to how to call your API. That's where they learn about the API. It's where they can test calls, play with the console, and I'll show you the developer portal in just a few minutes. Those developers then go on to build apps and services. And those apps and services are what call your API, but they never go directly to your API. They always go via our proxy. And the proxy is where the magic happens. So the proxy can uh, change the uh, the call, you know, it can do XML to JSON conversion, it collects analytics, it can uh, rate limit, it can uh, implement all of the policies that are the magic that is API management. 
And the good news is, of course, that API, um, that API can be hosted anywhere. It can be hosted on premises. It can be hosted on a rival cloud. You know, you can host it on Amazon or Rackspace. It really doesn't matter. Um, obviously, we love it if you host it on Azure, but it's not a requirement. Um, it's also <clears throat> can be written in any language. So it can be .NET, it can be PHP, Node.js, we don't care. As long as it speaks the language of the web, as long as it speaks HTTP, we are good to go. So I think at that point, it is time for a quick demo. I think I just saw Michael ask if there's any questions. Are there any questions worth tackling at this stage? No question. Uh, most people are on mute still at the minute, Josh. It's, uh probably best to just keep going for now and I'll keep an eye out for any coming up in the box. Sounds good, okay. Let's switch over to a little demo then. So creating an instance of API management is easy. You come to the Azure portal as you would expect and you create, uh, click new, um, app services, API management, create, enter some details and click go and you'll be creating a, a new instance of API management and that we're actually creating some VMs for you, we're actually sort of provisioning some virtual machines, some worker roles that will process the analytics and obviously some front end roles that are going to handle the API traffic that's coming through and so it takes about eight minutes so I'm not going to do that now. Um, I'm going to use one that we created earlier called API demo and if I click on the name you'll see our um, our quick start which points to all the documentation. We also have a dashboard that has some very high, le high level analytics and the scale tab which is where you can scale your service. So we have two tiers, the developer tier which during preview is $49 per month um, and isn't really designed for production usage. This is really for your dev and your test scenarios that you'd use this instance. We also have a standard tier. So standard tier is what you'd use for production um, and that can handle each instance of standard can do 200 million API calls per month and has uh, a gig of cache. And you can scale up to four instances of that, so up to 800 million API calls per month. And if you need more than that, all you need to do is contact us. Actually, we're, we're not limited to four, it's just during preview that we, we have this uh, artificial limit here in the portal. If you want more than that, just contact us. Um, I'll show you contact details at the end, and uh, we'd be happy to, to do that. Um, we just discard my changes here. Configuration here, one thing we can also do, of course, is since you're going to have a developer portal um, that contains the documentation, and you're going to have an API proxy, they're going to have an internet address. And the default internet address is something like this, api-demo.azure-api.net or api-demo.portal.azureapi.net. And um, you probably want to have a custom brand there. And of course, we support custom domains. So you can specify your custom domain here and you can upload your SSL certificate. So you can have, I don't know, if you're um, dev.stevenson.com, whatever, we'll support that. You can, you can load that up so that you have a full control over your own brand. Now, if I want to manage an individual API and change the operations, then I click this manage button down here and jump into our publisher portal. And the publisher portal is where I can set up and configure my API. So what we're going to do now actually is I'm going to give you a quick demo of adding a new API um, and managing a new API. So we have um, a simple API that is um, that adds numbers for me. So you can see it here. Um, you can see our, um, let me change this to a get actually. You can see our simple API that's hosted now on a web role, this is not a managed API. It's a very simple um, web API that's just hosted on a cloud service. It's called the Calc API and it allows me to add numbers, so it's awesome. Uh, so I can add two numbers here, A and B. Um, I hit send on this get and it should give me a response that is a value of eight, right? So four and four is eight, that works, that's, that's cool. So it gives me a little XML response. This is a real API that you guys can go and try out and invoke right now. Um, what I'm gonna do is turn it into a managed API. So I'm gonna copy this URL because we're gonna manage it and I'm gonna add an API here into my portal. I'm gonna call this the calculator matron. I'm gonna paste in that URL and I'm going to cut the suffix, I don't need that actually. And then I'm going to add a little suffix here, calc, and I hit save. So in just a second or so, that will show up in my portal, and I can start to enter some settings. And I actually want to do this, even though it's a little dull for you watch me write. This is an awesome API that allows me to add numbers. 
because I'm going to show you how this data is used later. And notice that we have um, different options for connecting to the back end. Um, I'll show you a lot of the configuration as we move through, but a lot of options in terms of configuring how you communicate um, to the original back end. So now what I'm going to do is show you how to add an operation. We're going to add that addition operation. I'm going to do a get. I can paste in my URL here, but maybe I don't like the look of this URL. Maybe I'd rather do something a little different. And what I can do is actually do URL rewriting in the proxy layer. So I'm going to say it's just add, and then I'm going to use parameters like this to project a different API at the front end. So now I'm just using these little parameter markers. I can add a display name, call it the number adder, say the description adds numbers for you. Obviously you put something better in here. Um, I can turn on caching. So since this is a very cacheable response, I can actually enable caching here on my API. And that's going to reduce the response time and reduce the load on the back end for whenever I have a cacheable um, response. Um, I can document the parameters. Notice that it's automatically sensed I have an A and B parameter. This is the first number. I'm going to document here. This is the second number. I can specify the types. You know, I can say it's a number or it's an integer. I can specify some values, some default values, some example values that will help a, de a developer learn how to use the API. Because that's really what I'm doing here. I'm documenting the API that's going to be used. This metadata is going to be used to generate the developer portal. And I'll show you that in just a few seconds. So I can also add example responses. So I could add, uh, show what a 401 and authorized looks like. I'm actually just going to show a 200 OK. I can add different representations in case I have, uh, I support Coneg or content negotiation. Um, I'm going to add an example XML response here. So result value might be seven. And I'm going to save that. And my API is now ready to be published. Um, and to publish it, what I have to do is just add it to a product. And products are just logical grouping containers. So you can see here I have some products that are accessible to different groups, um, such as administrators, developers, or guests. I can create these groups however I wish. I can create as many as I like. I can have a best friends group, a private group, a premium group, um, and I can create products as many as I like. And they're really just ways in, of grouping APIs and providing access to them. So I need to add it. So I'm going to add it to my test product here. Uh, I'm going to say add an API. I'm going to add the calculator Matron. I hit save. Uh, it's not published, so I need to publish this API. And now, my API is ready for people to use. So let me show you the experience that a developer or a partner would have if they came to use the API. And so here we have the, um, the developer portal. This is what a developer would see if they turn up to your, to your portal, you know, your dev.stevenson.com or whatever. Now, I'm already signed in as an administrator because I single signed in from the uh, management experience, but a developer could easily sign up, can come here, click on the sign up button, create a new account, and they can also sign in um, by creating a private account that just belongs to this system, or they can use Facebook or Google or Microsoft account or Twitter. We support um, uh, social IDs as well. Now, if I take a look here, because I'm already signed in as an administrator, you'll see that I have this um, my, a list of my APIs, including the one I just created. And notice how the metadata I added is being used to generate this documentation. So this is all being dynamically generated. I didn't have to author this, um, this documentation at all. Um, but this whole developer portal is actually a very customizable, very powerful CMS system. Let me show you some of our, our um, existing customers that are using this. So if I just open up um, the, this Chrome browser down here. Um, these are customers that are live on Azure API Management right now. So we have Wellmark, which is a health provider. This is the Azure API Management portal that you're looking at here. And notice how it can be styled to exactly match your brand. Um, here's another one, um, Blue Garden, which are a payroll company. Um, that's also exactly the same system, but the experience has been customized. Uh, we have Speak to It here, which is a, oh, actually I've got the, oh, what's the URL for this? They change the custom domain. There we go. Um, API.ai um, is also running on Azure API Management. 
and this is again a a, uh, a different portal. Um, another customer that's running on Azure API management is Fantasy Data, which sells um, NFL data, and all of this documentation here has just been entered in the CMS, so it's all running on the developer portal provided by Azure API management. So it can be easily styled. You don't have to know even know how to write CSS or um, HTML. We just have a design tool that helps you do that. Um, you see it presents beautifully consistent and very easy to understand documentation for your API. So I have my URL structure. I have my parameters with documentation. We can even generate code samples based on the me metadata that was entered. So if you want to know how to call this from a, um, from a Ruby backend, here's the code you'd need to invoke this, this API. Now, my favorite feature is the console, which actually allows developers to interact with the API in real time. So let me show you this in action. And what you'll see is I can, um, this form has been generated based on the metadata that we have. I can enter the different information, choose the developer key, the uh, subscription key that identifies me, hit get, and that's gonna invoke um, the back end in real time, and I can see my response here, I can see the latency, um, and that's the latency including the underlying service. So the latency of our proxy is actually very, very small, you know, um, between uh, uh, 10 to 50 milliseconds on average, so very, very small. And there you can see the actual response that came from the service, so indeed adding 5 and 5 is 10. Um, I can see all of the headers. Um, this file here is because I turned on tracing in my request header. If I open this file up in Google Chrome, you will actually see, I'm just using Google Chrome because it has a better view of JSON, um, I'll actually see everything that happened in the lifetime of my request. So you can see um, uh, all of the different stages that happened in the portal, including what the, orig the actual backend API request looked like. So you can see here the um, using the query string version on Calc API, that's how it, that's what the manifested uh, request looked like. Um, let me hit this again a couple of times, actually one thing you'll see is we got a much faster response time the second time because the service was warmed up, down to 25 milliseconds now because we're using the, the cache, so very, very fast response times from the, um, from the API service. Um, I want to show you quickly, I want to make sure we leave some time for Q&A, but I want to show you quickly some of the other features that we have in this um, in this service. So one of my favorite capabilities is policies, which is the ability to change the underlying API without writing a single line of code. And we can apply policies at multiple scopes, at the product scope or the um, API scope. In this case, I'm going to apply it at the operation scope. And I'm going to um, configure this. And what I can do is drop in different statements. So we have tons of different statements here that you can use. And I'm going to do a conversion. So I'm actually going to convert from XML to JSON. So I'm just going to configure this now. I'm going to be pretty aggressive and always do the conversion, even if I don't think the input is XML. But you know, probably not the best choice for a production service, but fine for a demo. I hit save, and I'm choosing the direct XML to JSON because I think it produces pretty adjacent. Now that's pushing out to my API proxies, and if I hit get again down here, I will get a, oh, oh it mustn't have updated just yet. Let me try again. Hmm. I seem to have a little issue. What have I done wrong here? Let me see. So on my outbound, I did XML to JSON. Apply always. I'm calling the right API. Oh, I know what I'm doing. So not your cache, Josh. It's caching. It's caching. I'm going to need to let my cache expire. <coughs> let me go and turn off caching. Well done, uh, Michael. Well spotted. The cache has probably expired now, actually. But I'm just going to turn it off in case. Give it a couple of seconds. There we go, and now it's working. So obviously we had a, just a, a, a cached item there that was uh, that was still being respond, responded. But now we're now we're actually getting a request and a response, and it's passing through our pipeline. We can convert to JSON with just a very um, simple policy. Another one I want to show you actually is another policy is rate limiting. This is very common and would have been great in the scenario I described to you guys before. Um, so I'm going to turn on uh, rate limiting for our test product that we just created. So I'm going to choose a product. I'm going to add a policy. And on the inbound request, I'm going to say, let's limit the call rate. I'm going to edit this. 
I must say I only want three calls within a 60 second period from any given partner. Hit save, let that change push out to the API proxies, go back over here, hit get, and then that should give me a response, hit get again, I should get another response, and then on this third request, oh, try again, why is this taking so long to update? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I think the proxies were taking a second to update that. Um, but now you see I got a response that said too many requests. And it's actually telling me, um, gives me even more information actually, and says try again in 51 seconds. Um, so my uh, 35 seconds. So now my developers, my partners are, excuse me, I'm going to see. Excuse me. Struggling with hay fever today. Um, my um, uh, partners are now limited each, so the, the advantage of this, of course, is that they can't bring down my mission-critical internal system, and they can't um, hit the service so hard as to degrade the service for other partners is another important part of the, the capability. Let me switch back to the publisher portal, show you very quickly the analytics solution. So we are, all the time, we're logging information about your API. So you can see we have this at a glance view that's showing me who the top developers are, who the top products are, how many calls are coming through, what the average response time is of the whole service end to end. Um, we can drill into usage. We can actually drill in in some detail and see uh, the, uh, the calls, where they're coming from in the world in, uh, geographically. I can see where the bandwidth is being consumed from geographically. I can zoom in and see that this is coming from Washington State. No surprise, that's where I am based right now. I can understand the health of my API. So um, what, what status codes am I seeing? So you can see here we're getting pretty much just successful calls. Um, in a second, the analytics will update, and I would also see those blocked calls. And the analytics typically takes about... Uh, uh, one minute to update, one to, one to five minutes to update, so it's near real time. I can even see how I'm doing with respect to cash. So you can see here we have some um, cash hits, so I was doing pretty well with the cash, and one cash miss where the cash had expired for some reason. Um, uh, we actually did that deliberately, and then the very first hit, of course, would have been a, a cash miss because the, the cash hadn't yet been um, uh, hadn't yet been completed. Um, and we can also look at response time. So if we look at the average response time for the service here, it's 204 milliseconds, with a min of 14 milliseconds, so extremely fast, and a max of 943. So that'll be the typical thing of the back end warming up the first time I hit it. Um, and we can also see what the actual underlying API response time was. Um, so the the max response time of the uh, of the underlying API was 198 milliseconds. The average was about 46. So we can do a delta there and see where the warm up time is taking is taking place. So that's a very quick look at the developer portal. I, the la sorry, of the publisher portal and its analytics. Last thing I want to show you very quickly is how you can how easy it is to customize the appearance of your developer portal. And then hopefully there'll be a few minutes left for questions. So what I'm going to do now is um, turn on customization, and it'll switch me to a view of my developer portal that's been uh, designed to make it very easy to customize all the different features. Um, I'm going to discard my changes here, so actually I'm going to uh, preview the changes. How do I do this now? I've forgotten. Yep, discard the changes I did from my previous demo. Let me reset this thing back to, to where it was. So I begin customization. And um, this is the default template, but now I can start to pick elements. Simply, let's go up here and pick this. And then start to choose uh, different features I want to change. So let's say we want to make that font bigger and make it 2EM instead of 1.25. And I'd also like to change the color, perhaps, of the, um, of the background. Let's say the, oh, what have we got here, the default background. Let's make this a nice blue instead. And then I can say preview those changes. And in just a second, that will change in real time. I actually start to update the appearance. As you can see in there, you can see the size of the buttons has changed here as well as I changed to 2EM. So you can actually start to customize the less variables that are driving this just using our designer. I can even go and explain, explore what the rest of the pages look like. And this isn't visible to everybody. It's only visible to me as the administrator whilst I'm doing customization. So I haven't published this change yet. If I did want to publish them, I would simply click Publish here and then confirm that change, but I don't want to do that. Uh, but you see how easy it is to style the portal and edit the content, 
all using our interactive tooling that's built in to the solution. And at that point, let me switch back to the slides very quickly. These are the features that we have in preview right now, so uh, a nice big list of features. I'll send this deck over to, to Michael to distribute out to people who are, uh, who are able to join the call. Um, and we have some new features coming along very soon, including OAuth support. Uh, we have mutual certificate support for connecting to the back end coming. We have um, uh, also a, a full management API coming very soon. And I'd love to hear feedback from you guys in terms of features you'd like to see for the service. I think that's probably the end of the slides. Let me transition to this slide so everybody has my contact details. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh Twist. You can email me at jtwist at microsoft.com if you have any questions, and you'll find all of our documentation at azure.microsoft.com slash APIM. Um, that leaves us with about eight or nine minutes left if you guys have any questions. Um, 